always veto any decisions. This would, however, reproduce the consensus constraints that a supranational European democracy would have to overcome. And Dieter Grimm, who is a German constitutionalist, points out that the dilemmas of supranational democratic governance could not be solved simply by the fact that even if a European right of suffrage and European parties strengthens the legitimacy of the electorate to the, EU, uh, to the EP, the European Parliament, the European Parliament would not have the power to advance politically important decisions, even if they were supported by the citizens. Why? Because the European Union has given itself, developed and strengthened over time, an economic constitution, which has written economic laws into the treaties which can't be changed uh, by majorities in the European Parliament, which needs uh, uh, unanimity. So this is a problem, but of course, uh, if you spot a problem, you could also think about uh, ways of resolving this problem. And there is a discussion uh, um, underway to um, how to this could be done. Well, there is um, another German proposition or conception, a book published at the beginning of this year by two economists, Johannes Becker and Clemens Füst, or there is a T lacking, Füst, Der Odysseus Complex. Um, I guess this is rather new and maybe not translated in English, so a few of you uh, would have access to that. Clemens Fust is the successor director of the München IFO Institute, the uh, think tank, um, conservative, and uh, let's say right um, um, uh, orthodox, uh, economically orthodox think tank, um, proposing a pragmatic strategy for resolving the euro crisis. Well, um, what do they propose? The opposite of what Habermas advocates, the decentralization of fiscal resources and fiscal responsibility. So democracy would be uh, uh, strengthened at the national level. Democratic autonomy would mean everybody could make mistakes. Every national government could pile up debt but then the consequences would have to be borne by national, by the societies, yeah? uh, the people, national people. And the European Union would give up uh, rescue attempts. Um, okay, uh, and then there is the French proposal where maybe Thomas Piketty is well known to most of you. Uh, Henette. Stephanie Henet, uh, Guillaume Sacris, and Antoine Boucher, who have published, meanwhile, in all major languages, from French to German to English, Italian, uh, maybe also Greek, uh, their TDEM, their Treaty on Democratizing the Core of the European Union, the Eurozone. And this is uh, a proposal which takes into account the um, multi-level governance structure, so bringing in national representatives, national parliamentary representatives, and European parliamentary rep representatives into a new Eurozone parliament, which they propose. They want to strengthen the Eurozone uh, budget and foster Eurozone sovereignty uh, on many political fields from economy to the social, the social policy. There are quite a bit of criticisms uh, also here. One of them by advocates of the European Parliament, of course seeing a competition with a new Eurozone Parliament. The problem of what, uh, how to overcome the reluctance or maybe objections by uh, non-Eurozone member States who would left outside. Um, nevertheless, also these problems could be addressed. Mm, I think the major problem is, and this gets me to my last point, the lack of instruments of how to improve representation within the Eurozone Parliament, 
and how to improve the participation of citizens. So um, the concept of parliamentary representation on which this book is based is quite traditional and we have seen over the past decades that this is too little in order to meaningfully engage citizens in very complex and demanding decision-making situations. And therefore, I'm proposing, and I'm proposing to learn from the a crisis which is now 12 years ago when the treaty, uh, the constitutional treaty for the European Union failed, failed the ratification in France and in the Netherlands. After that, um, many knowledgeable scholars came together and saying we need more deliberative democratic tools, more tools for meaningful deliberation, for informing uh, and helping citizens, bringing citizens in to make them participate in information and will formation. So for example, citizens' consultation should be more, made more meaningful to ad advance education of the citizens by experts during the debates. Deliberative polls, including transnational deliberative polling, um, citizens' consensus conferences that are open to all and connected to council with more restricted civil society participation, and the task of decision making, linking citizens' co deliberations, consultations with decision making. Yeah, not um, practicing them both apart. And methods of discursive res representation. So in order to have substantive representation, you should have represented or get represented the different discourses that represent different views and problem situations and needs of different kinds and groups of people. Yeah? So you don't have a quantitative representation and uh, one man, one vote, but you look at your representative assembly whether you really have all those that are affected and maybe don't have a voice uh, so far, whether you get their voice represented. Well, and I think Emmanuel Macron's, um, one of his proposals is to organize from next year on, the year 2018, citizens conventions, not at the European level, but at the national level, um, deliberative instruments or the toolkit of, uh, of making uh, citizens participate more meaningfully uh, in terms of deliberative democracy, uh, this would be a great chance to make these, these national conventions on the future of Europe a success. Well, I'm getting now to the end. In conclusion, of course, uh, in order to make this vision a realistic one, the Macron's vision, TDEM, I should say, the Treaty for Democratizing the Eurozone, is um, a very concrete proposal. They already have the four authors developed a legislative proposal, which you could bring into the European Parliament and national parliaments very easily, yeah? very detailed, very knowledgeable. But in order to make these proposals fly in view of a better improved uh, democratic governance, the German government, uh, the new coalition, should somehow uh, cooperate. And still now, uh, we have seen, I, I already mentioned, that the electoral campaigns were nearly, we tried uh, to write something on the, on the press, and there were some people who said we should do more on Europe, but other topics were more interesting. Yeah? So the refugee crisis. Nevertheless, now the, on the agenda for the Green Party, and you see two of them, Katrin Mose and Richard, they stand for a green priority list. And one of the three priorities, one you have heard before by Olga Kosu, which is the ecological transformation of the economy. Another one is social justice. And the third one is Europe, European reform, uh, uh, strengthening Europe in terms of a supranational model, the Juncker, the Juncker plan. So the, basically the Greens, Jutti Kofer from the European Parliament and 
don't go Dunkers. Uh, fifth, no, sixth scenario, yeah? Not the five uh, in the white book, but his fifth, uh, his sixth, which he has presented in September, democratizing uh, European Union. Well, um, it's on its way, and it seems that uh, the uh, Chancellor Merkel is, um, uh, is willing and wants, it has made this a priority two. This is what she says, and I think this is, um, um, uh, I would doubt that, but we, uh, I think the most um, uh, risky uh, or uh, uncertain um, uh, question is how the liberals, if they would want the finance ministry, how this would work. Uh, we would need a very clear coalition treaty which defines what the ministry should do. So the maneuver space, this was also this is, um, a precondition. Here you see the networks between the various parties and the new coalition which is in the shaping is called Jamaica because of the colors of the three parties, uh, black, yellow and green. a quote which I found somehow intriguing by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk 100 years ago and he is a son of Thessaloniki, right? Saying no country is free unless it's democratic. Of course we need to translate this into the 21st century, apply this to the European Union, its member states but also neighboring countries uh, still like Turkey and uh, with this I want to end and thank you for your patience and I'm looking forward for your comments. Συνεχίζουμε το δεύτερο μέρος αφού ευχαριστήσουμε την κυρία Λίμπερτ και επειδή έβαλε στην συζήτηση το ζήτημα της συμμετοχής ε, του κόσμου και του κοινού θα θέλαμε και από εσά αν έχετε κάποια ζητήματα, κάποια ερωτήματα να θέσετε έτσι πολύ γρήγορα και στην ίδια και στους ε, τέσσερις καθηγητές από τα δύο πανεπιστήμια της πόλης αν έχετε κάποια ζητήματα, κάποια ερωτήματα που θέλετε να θέσετε για το μέλλον της Ευρώπης επειδή το, το κοινό μας είναι έτσι αρκετά με ανικό, θα, είχε, θα έδινε και μεγάλο ενδιαφέρον στη συζήτηση. Υπάρχει κάποιος που ενδιαφέρεται. Ναι. Ε, θέλετε να σηκωθείτε, να μας ε, συστηθείτε και να μας θέσετε το, το ερώτημα, γιατί δεν βλέπω κάπου να κυκλοφορεί μικρόφωνο. Έχουμε μικρόφωνο, αλλά ναι. Ελπίζω τώρα να ακούγομαι καλύτερα. Ε, για πολλά χρόνια έχουμε ζήσει μία έμφαση της, ε, της, ευρωπαϊκής, της ευρωπαϊκής ζαργόνας, το πούμε έτσι, και όχι μόνο, συνοδευόταν βεβαίως και από πολιτικές, σε σχέση με την Ευρώπη των περιφερειών, σε αντίθεση με την Ευρώπη των ε, ε, εθνικών κρατών. Η ερώτηση που έχω να κάνω είναι... Ε, για ποιο λόγο η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση, τα όργανα της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης, στην παρούσα φάση όπου βλέπουμε ότι η Ευρώπη των Περιφερειών 
Βλέπε αποσχιστικά κινήματα στην Καταλονία, στι Σκωτία, στην Βόρεια Ιρλανδία, αποσχιστικά στο βαθμό που είναι αποσχιστικά, εν πάση περιπτώσει. Στην Ιταλία που είχαμε χθε επίση κάποια τοπικά δημοψηφίσματα κτλ. κτλ που βλέπουμε ότι, ότι ουσιαστικά ε, ευρωπαϊκέ περιφέρειε προσπαθούν να αρθρώσουν την, το λόγο του και, το, και να ορθώσουν το ανάστημά του. Και βλέπουμε ότι σε αντίθεση με αυτή την προσπάθεια, που θα μπορούσε ίσω να χαρακτηριστεί και μια προσπάθεια εν μέρη εκδημοκρατικοποίηση ίσω τη Ευρωζώνη, τη ε, ε, Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση, δεν παίζει ρόλο. Λοιπόν, σε μια τέτοιου είδου προσπάθεια, βλέπουμε ότι η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση, τα όργανα τη Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση, κάνουν ένα βήμα πίσω και αντί να ενθαρρύνουν ενδεχομένως κάποιες τέτοιε προσπάθειες με σκοπό ίσως τη διεύρυνση των, ε, της ευρωπαϊκής δημοκρατίας, του εκδημοκρατισμού της Ευρώπης, βλέπουμε ότι κρατιούνται πίσω και αφήνουν αυτό το θέμα να το χειριστούν τα ε, κράτη-μέλη, ε, κρατώντας μια επιφυλακτική στάση. Κάποιο σχόλιο... Η ερώτηση είναι κάποιο σχόλιο πάνω σε αυτό. Δηλαδή, αν θα είχε μια, μια σκοπιμότητα να ενθαρρυνθούν τέτοιου είδου κινήσει, αν, αν θα ήταν σκόπιμο το αντίθετο να καταπιεστούν τέτοιου είδου κινήσει και για ποιο λόγο το ένα, για ποιο λόγο το άλλο. Mm -hmm. ε, να συγκεντρώσουμε, αν υπάρχουν ένα-δύο ερωτήματα, τα οποία φαντάζομαι από τη συζήτηση θα απαντηθούν εδώ από του καλεσμένου. Υπάρχει κάποιο άλλο που θα ήθελε να θέσει κάποιο ζήτημα. I will address the question to the speaker, Mr. Liebert. Ms. Liebert. Uh, my name is Vikelidi Tolili. I'm a PhD candidate in the University of Macedonia. Um, there is a growing tendency to create a pan-European list of uh, members of European Parliament uh, based on the redistribution of the UK seats before Brexit. Uh, the Chair of the Constitutional Affairs, um, Ms. Danuta Hubner, uh, claims that the legal basis is missing for that. Uh, so, could you give us uh, your opinion on this? Do you believe that uh, this uh, pan-European list of uh, candidates would uh, contribute to lessening the democratic gap in uh, the European Union? Υπάρχει κάποιος άλλος που θέλει να θέσει ερώτημα. Ε, ωραία, να πάρουμε και αυτό το ερώτημα και στη συνέχεια να ξεκινήσουμε με τους καθηγητές εδώ των ε, πανεπιστημίων και θα έλεγα να, να, να κάνει το κλείσιμο η καλεσμένη μας από την ε, Βρέμη με ε, τα, τα σχόλιά της και τις παρατήρησεις στα ειδικά σας ερωτήματα και σε όσα θα ακούσει από τους συναδέλφους σας. Thank you for your speech, professor. Well, my question has to do with participation in uh, democracy. In the heart of uh, democracy uh, lives the participation of the people. But the epitome of the participation are the referenda in a democracy. Are we sure that the referenda in a democracy, in this democracy, in the European democracy, are the right way to progress? Thank you. Ωραία, νομίζω θέσατε πολύ κέρια ερωτήματα, τα αποσχιστικά κινήματα, τα οποία όμως ε, οι περιφερές θέλουν να παραμείνουν εντός της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης, το Brexit και τα δημοψηφίσματα, οπότε έχετε πολύ υλικό. Ωραία. Directly to uh, Professor Liebert's uh, paper because I think that's a job that has to be done tomorrow, more depth in the closed seminar. So I will. Um, okay, so I will uh, some, give some ideas. I have two or three ideas to uh, offer so that probably that would be food for thought. There's no doubt that the European Union is at a crossroads and it will either evolve into something a closer union probably even a federation, or it might really disband because after several years of intertwined and uh, 
mutually reinforcing crisis, the stakes are now extremely high. The crux of the matter, I think, lies at the capacity of responsiveness of the EU political system in the wake of crisis. How do we respond to crisis? The Union needs to prove to its people that it can effectively react to the confidence crisis, that's the only crisis nobody is talking about, but that's the underlying crisis, the confidence crisis, plaguing it due to the widespread impression among European citizens that the sacrifices they are experiencing are not even handily distributed. So more deeply, the EU needs to show that it still has survival adaptation reflexes. So it must convince the European citizens that it still is capable of satisfying the quest for justice by demonstrating that it can respond to the basic demands of collective life, it that it has neither abdicated nor been captured by special interests or nationalistic agendas. Now, the first, uh, after this brief introduction, the first uh, idea I want to throw in is the uh, capacity of crisis management. I would like to offer some ideas on primary and secondary crisis, in the, uh, especially in the EU, because each system of governance must incorporate necessarily certain precautions, certain rules, organs, practices, for the successful handling of crisis, of bursting crisis, be them structural crisis or conjunctural crisis. This obligation stems simply from each system's basic aim of self-preservation as a system without wasting too much energy and resources and without this effort undermining, of course, the justificatory foundations themselves on which the system is based. So with the EU as a complex, multi-level, gradually evolving political and economic system of governance has witnessed throughout the years, these last years, multiple, what I will call primary crises that partially at least feed back into one another and are seconded by secondary crises. These crises can be divided into those for whom the EU itself is not to blame, which I call exogenous crises, and those for whom the EU has a smaller or larger share of responsibility that I call endogenous crises. That, but the management of both crises, exogenous and endogenous, lies in the same system of governance, which is called nolens volens, to solve them effectively and justly without ultimately differentiating between them as to their political effects. When a system of governance does not appear in the eyes of the citizens, and its citizens who constantly evaluate it to cope with this mission, to cope well at least with this mission, then it enters into a secondary crisis. So a secondary crisis is a crisis that arises from the lack of an adequate response by a political system of governance to the political, to the primary, excuse me, crisis that it has to handle and that actually worsens the latter, the primary crisis, by feeding back into them. So this may happen for several reasons. For example, the forecasts the system has made have proven de facto inadequate or the predictions are not correctly applied uh, without, without the true intention meaning of comp collectively overcoming the crisis. There are plenty of reasons. So if, if, we, if, we, if we give a dispassionate and scientifically detached look, a glance, this unfortunately seems to be the case with the European Union today because there are several endogenous and exogenous crises. For example, exogenous conjunctural crises is the refugee crisis because the EU member states' foreign policies are absolutely not to blame for refugee crisis. Um, there are others that are endogenous structural crises like the Eurozone crisis that certainly has to do with the suboptimal currency zone that we call economic and monetary union. We will uh, delve into that tomorrow, I hope. So to these individual primary crises, which are like you know, tributaries of a river that flow into a, you know, into a large and overflowing river, are also added endogenous but conjunctural crises, such as, for example, the Brexit one. It's just a conjunctural thing that happened because David Cameron, a sort of leap of populist faith, wanted to, for purely internal political reasons, to make uh, his right-wing uh, Tories shut up, and we know uh, what happens, actually. So all these crises, these primary crises, need to be addressed by the existing institutions, as I said, rules and procedures of a supranational arrangement that had started uh, moderately as a common market and in many cases has not, had not anticipated at all, had delayed or simply had connived 
at the quest for mutually acceptable, rational, fair crisis management and resolution mechanisms. It is a fact that the union has advanced, of course, through crisis. That's what we all learn to our st students. And, 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 and this is described in the European integration manuals. But the problem is here, in my view, that in the previous crisis, the conjuncture presented itself as more favorable uh, than the contemporary one, both because there were not so many primary crises combined, each other, uh, simultaneously, and they did not fold back into one another uh, so vigorously. And moreover, the political will to solve them uh, always remained extremely strong, at least at the core of the Union, of course, the famous Franco-German axis. Is there a political will today, such a will? Well, uh, we heard Professor Liebert, and of course, the following months will show. Now, I want to say a couple of words on the second idea, the democratic deficit as a main cause of the rise of anti-Europeanism. Of course, it's a common place to talk about the so-called democratic deficit, but I mean, I think that the real point here is that un unlike a federation, federation like the United States, European citizens do not have the institutional capacity to elect a European government. Let's call it very clearly like that, because that means that they cannot choose based on political platforms that are offered by political offer, on political, ideological, and economic criteria, a president of the EU who would be the chief of the executive and who would choose his or her ministers, drawing up simultaneously the political guidelines of his or her cabinet, within which, of course, the ministers must forward their action. I think that's the core of the point. Now, this political representation deficit becomes not only stronger, but also qualitatively more serious during this uh, you know, crisis, this interminable crisis, actually, that we have been experiencing in recent years in Europe. And the EU, of course, is the largest single economic zone in the world and the internal market, but it's also a, you know, a geopolitical arrangement that has not really developed political tools to pursue an integrated economic policy. And now, suppose that the majority of European citizens wanted to change the course of European economic policy. That was one of the points that uh, uh, Professor Lieber uh, talked about in her presentation, turning it from some kind of monetarist, you know, vision of a macroeconomic model that is based on, uh, you know, continuous budget cuts to balance public deficits, tight monetary policy, and so on, to something else, something completely different of a Keynesian kind of sort, of we think of fiscal stimulus against the generalized stagnation or re recession. Now, could this happen? This happened in the United States, of course, in the New Deal. This happened also in the United States in 2008 in, uh, by ch where Americans cho chose very clearly between two very distinct political and macroeconomic uh, proposals, the one by the Democrats, by Obama, and the other by the Republicans, and they chose very clearly. Could this be possible in our case? Unfortunately, no, because there was, there's really no transmission uh, belt between the floating policy, the changing policy choices that Europeans make and the comprehensive economic philosophy that underlies, that is constitutionalized more or less, that it underlies, constantly governs the Union. So European citizens sort of intuitively know that whatever they vote in the European Parliament elections, both the macroeconomic assumptions on which the operation of, for example, the Eurozone rests, and the intergovernmental, which is the last point, intergovernmentalism, political management of the crisis, instead of a community or a union one, will continue, as it is, seamlessly without changing. And the realization of this sense of weakness, political weakness, ultimately leads to the uh, identification of current policies with the European Union itself. And thus, the unfortunate result is the rise of Euroscepticism and uh, mostly in the form of uh, extreme right populist wing uh, uh, governments or you know, political parties that we have been seeing. And the last uh, thing is, of course, intergovernmentalism. I, I just uh, mentioned it. I also want to put in the discussion neo-mercantilism because I think it's important as we talk about economics as well. Um, now, the begin since the beginning of the systemic crisis in the Eurozone in like 2008 or 9, the intergovernmental factor in EU governments ha governance has gained power clearly to the detriment of the union spirit. Instead of comprehensive plans prepared and piloted by the European Commission under the democratic monitoring of the European Parliament and with the aid, of course, of the European Central Bank, it seems that the EU leaders now let national bargaining lines and strategies take hold at the heart of the European integration process. Yet, the problem is that national rivalries, 
uh, not only produce lesser democratic legitimacy and weaker member uh, and, excuse me, alienate European citizens, especially those from the weaker member states, but from the European project, but they also bring about a decreased efficiency, equality, decreased quality of decision making, because intergovernmentalism in its essence is by definition, it, it is something that strives to reconcile a myriad of, of, of different uh, particular national needs and requirements instead of producing regulation that promotes the European collective interest over and above the particularistic self-centered national interests or the interest that national governments conceive as such. So this governance model applied in the EU, we have a complex multi-level polycentric governance. It is a basically a model of coordination between different types of actors through vertical horizontal networks that involve both member states, civil society in a complex web of decision making and policy implementation at the EU at the national regional uh, level. But this model that is clearly differentiated from the classical government models in nation, nation states, which are based on a unified political system, hierarchically organized administrative mechanism. This, our model under the crisis has been unfortunately producing quite a few erratic practices in the management of the crisis, breeding thus indeterminacy and insecurity. One only needs to, 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 to remember how many times the Grexit, the Grexit uh, uh, rhetoric was just was shown up, it was like a wild card that was uh, drawn on the table, which of course made things extremely difficult to manage, uh, not only for Greece of course. So it worsens the regulatory quality of decisions. And this trend is clearly borne, that's my last point, by the appearance of neo-mercantilism. Namely, what, what do you mean by that? Well, of course, I mean the economic uh, protectionism at the expense of trading partners for the sake of boosting domestic industry. I'll just give one example. The car industry, which is an extremely important industry, has been protected nationally by, for example, the German government. When uh, I, I, I made a research on that, when the EU legislation on the maximum possible amount of CO2, of carbon dioxide emissions from passenger cars were, was passing. At the time, Germans were lagging behind because they, were, you know, they have this tendency to produce big, heavy energy intensive cars. And the new rules would give a competitive edge to the French and Italian ones who were like more light and, 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 and less, uh, you know, energy intensive. Uh, you know, so the go German government clearly, it's absolutely clear, acted essentially as a sort of sales representative of a powerful industrial lobby in a struggle to retain its market share. That's unfortunate, but that's really what happened. So I'm closing with just a, you know, a conclusion. I'm, I, I'm sure that the time has come for a radical overhaul of the EU governance model if the Union intends to lay down clear, strong, and efficient general rules of macroeconomic stability, competitiveness, the plans for a European fiscal union, a banking union, will necessarily limit the freedom of member states to determine in a sovereign manner their own policy mix through their discretionary use of their national budgets, something that is at the core of their national sovereignty. I think that's a good thing that it should happen. Uh, but, of course, it would need political legitimacy through some kind of European federalization. I'm clearly in favor, of course, of Habermas here. Otherwise, it is highly probable that they will worsen the democratic deficit of the Union if they go on like this, if they go on a, on a, an intergovernmental, hidden neo-mercantilist and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, constitutionalized economic underground, as I said. So, otherwise, it's uh, uh, more generally, the only way, I think, into out, into the clearing, is a sort of genuine federation with political union, some sort of debt uh, mutualization, at least the beginning of it, a banking union, certainly, European investments and social solidarity, with the hope, of course, that all this is not already too late, but 2017 was actually a year of hope, but I'm afraid only for the first half of it, because the second half was less of a hope. If we see what happened in Germany, I'm not very pleased with what happened in Germany, but I'm totally disappointed, over, even I'm, I'm scared by what happens right now in Austria and in Czech Republic. So, <laughs> The very deep wounds that these multiple crises, the intertwining crisis, have been uh, leaving, and the crisis management, secondary crisis, uh, is a bad thing, and we hope that this will go on. Thank you. Ευχαριστούμε τον κύριο Γιάννη Παπαδόπουλο, αναπληρωτή καθηγητή στο τμήμα διεθνών και ευρωπαϊκών σπουδών, μεταξύ άλλων και γιατί ήταν πολύ σύντομος και περιεκτικός.
Ε, Ήσασταν στο τέταρτο από του υπόλοιπου ομιλητέ. Θα παρακαλέσω να μείνουμε στο δεκάλεπτο για να έχουμε ένα διάλογο. Εσεί ε, ε, μα ε, προσγειώσατε λίγο, γιατί η κυρία Λίμπερτ είχε μια πιο αισιόδοξη προσέγγιση. Βάλατε θέματα όπω ε, η κρίση εμπιστοσύνη, το δημοκρατικό έλλειμμα και η απογοήτευση των πολιτών που αισθάνονται αδύναμοι, ακόμη και όταν του ζητείτε η γνώμη του ε, ε, στα δημοψηφίσματα ή βλέπουν την αδυναμία διαχείριση κρίσεων. Και όλα αυτά μα οδηγούν σε, σε ένα. Σε, σε μια απογοήτευση συλλογική. Και αυτό το είτε μας φέρνει στο δεύτερο μισό του 2017, που είναι λίγο ε, στενάχωρο. Το είναι το φθινόπορο μετά την άνοιξη του 2017. Λοιπόν, τώρα θέλουμε την, ε, την παρέμβαση της κυρίας Δέσποινας Αναγνωστοπούλου, που είναι αναπληρώτρια καθηγήτρια στο ίδιο τμήμα Διεθνών και Ευρωπαϊκών Σπουδών του Πανεπιστήμιου Μακεδονίας, σε όλα αυτά που ακούσαμε. Δεν ξέρω αν η δική σας προσέγγιση είναι αισιόδοξη ή πιο απεσιόδοξη. Ε, ε, το μικρόφωνο σε εσά. Πάρα πολύ, κυρία Χριστοφορίδου. Ε, και εγώ θα μιλήσω λίγο για την απογοήτευση των πολιτών. Ε, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Liebert for her presentation. And I will point to one uh, little um, phrase that Emmanuel Macron has said. Uh, he intends to build a Europe that can defend its values and its economic prosperity in the global order. But what happens if there is no prosperity? How can we defend the EU values in the case of economic crisis, like it happened in uh, uh, Greece and other countries in Europe? So um, I will speak about Article 3 of uh, the Treaty of the European Union, which lists the EU objectives. The first and foremost objective of the EU is to promote peace, its values, and the well-being of its peoples. And one of uh, the uh, objectives of the European Union is also social progress. That means that um, the EU is not merely an economic union, but is at the same time intended by common action to ensure social progress and seek constant improvement of the living and working conditions of the peoples of Europe, as is emphasized in the preamble of the treaty. So, what are the values of the European Union? It is dignity, human dignity, liberty, democracy, equality, rule of law, and fundamental rights in a pluralistic society. Have these uh, values been undermined in Greece? The answer is yes. Uh, where was the democracy when uh, the Greek parliament had to adopt in one day, in one night, in uh, five hours or 10 hours, a memorandum of understanding. Where is the democracy when the Eurozone um, Council um, worked uh, without any transparency, without any accountability? Um, where is the dignity when there are so many Greeks uh, without um, uh, income, without employment, without health insurance uh, sometimes? despite all the government's efforts to give access to hospitals and to doctors. And where are the fundamental rights when there are wages cut and uh, um, uh, pensions cut? All these uh, questions um, could take us about five hours to discuss, and we can do that in the seminar. But uh, today, I would like to speak about the secondary crisis, which Indeed, it was endogenous because of the financial crisis and the memoranda of understanding, but the European Union tried to show that it was exogenous. It was something that the member states had to deal with, that the European Union was not responsible for the measures that were taken in uh, uh, Greece, for example, the austerity measures that were taken in Greece, and that it was only Greece that was um, uh, that had to deal with these measures. Uh, 
So the EU values are uh, recognized as common guiding principles for both the European Union. Values are very important and they are more important than the objectives of the European Union since they are placed before the objectives. It is Article 2 that establishes the, the Union's values. And Article 3 just um, repeats those values. These values are also very important in the European uh, Economic and Monetary Union. Uh, all the articles of the treaty on the European and Economic and Monetary Union um, place uh, very high importance on the objectives of the European Union uh, during the management and establishment of the Economic and Monetary Union. There are three provisions of the Economic and Monetary Union as well as the Stability and Growth Pact that uh, speak about uh, refer to the objectives of the European Union that must guide um, all the institutions in that framework. In addition, the Lisbon Treaty makes many references to the EU values. Uh, so, um, uh, the EU confirms its attachment to the principles of liberty, democracy and respect and uh, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms and the rule of law. And there is a sanctions mechanism for in case that the uh, member state infringes uh, these um, uh, values. And uh, more important, the, the most important one in, for the crisis management is Article 13 of the Treaty of the European Union, which states that the EU has an institutional framework which shall aim to promote its values, advance its objectives, and serve the interests of the EU and its citizens and the member states. In this institutional framework are included the European Central Bank, the European Commission, the European Council, and the Council. All those that are responsible in the um, handling, the management of the economic crisis uh, in Greece, for example. But the problem that has been created and has been established is are the EU values binding even when the EU is acting outside its legal framework? Uh, the European Commission and the European Central Bank and the Council act uh, outside their framework, the framework of the Treaty of the European Union. That has been uh, the idea until the amendment of the treaty to include a possibility for the European stability mechanism uh, to um, handle all the crisis, the ESM. So uh, before this amendment, the EU um, institutions were clearly acting outside the legal framework of the European Union, outside of the charter of the application, the scope of application of the Charter for Fundamental Rights. And uh, that's why um, the European Commission and the European Central Bank, together with the Institutional Monetary Fund, could ask Greece and other countries to act contrary to fundamental rights. Uh, for example, the principle of equality or the principle of the rule of law or so. Um, Many academics uh, uh, um, confronted uh, all these problems and they, were, they said that uh, this has to change, that it cannot be that a European institutional organ can act outside um, what is EU law. And EU law comprises also the EU values. Uh, it cannot be that um, uh, uh, an institution like the European Central Bank can act contrary to the acquis communautaire, to the EU law. And um, this discussion, this academic discussion, uh, was heard also by the Court of Justice of the European Union, which in September 2016, uh, just 13 months ago, in a case that involved Cypriot, uh, Cypriots 
like Lydra advertising LTD and the family Eleftheriu and Theophilou and the family Theophilou, um, which had filed um, um, a case in action for compensation from the European Commission and the European Central Bank because um, their deposits uh, had been reduced according to the Memorandum of Understanding. The European Union Court, the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg, um, decided to uh, put a limit in all this and uh, clearly stated that the European Commission is an institution of the European Union, is the guardian of the European Union law, and it has always to act according to the EU law, even when it is acting outside the framework of the EU treaty, even when it is acting um, in the framework of memoranda of understanding, which were just intergovernmental and not EU acts. And that was very important that the uh, European Commission has to act according to uh, European Union law. And the problem is what happened in these 13 months. Uh, there was one case for, uh, submitted by Lemonia Sotiropoulou, a, a Greek uh, citizen, against the third Greek memorandum um, asking for compensation. The general court, which is um, the first degree court of the European Union uh, has decided uh, not to accept her case, though uh, it found that it was acceptable in, um, um, in um, form, uh, but uh, it has um, dismissed it in substance, uh, saying that the Council of the European Union, another institution organ that had to act according to EU law also, did not uh, infringe the limits of its discretionary power when uh, it cut the pensions. It asked Greece to, uh, act, to cut the pensions since it would be um, a very great economic instability if it didn't do so. Uh, and rights to property for social uh, security uh, are not absolute rights, they can be um, restricted in case of uh, general interest. Uh, so the case was dismissed, but if Lemonia Sotiropoulou brings this case to the Court uh, of Justice of the European Union by appeal, uh, then we do not know what the Court will say. And there is another case which is quite important. It is um, a Romanian citizen this was uh, Eugenia uh, Florescu, uh, who has also filed um, a compensation um, action in front of the Court of uh, Justice. That was uh, because there was a preliminary ruling. And this case, which was judged in June 2017, um, has found favorable um, result since um, uh, Romania had the Memorandum of Understanding, and uh, that uh, Memorandum of Understanding was based on a treaty article for financial assistance on member states. So we do not know what will happen. The, the problem is, will the Court of Justice of the European Union protect the citizens uh, when they complain uh, against all the acts um, caused by the Memoranda of Understanding? And how is the European uh, Citizens Project um, deteriorated because of the economic crisis and because the EU values were not protected? Thank you very much. Ευχαριστώ πολύ την κυρία Αναγνωστοπούλου και γιατί ήταν εντό χρόνου και γιατί έθεσε πολύ σημαντικά ερωτήματα κατά πόσο η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση, το, η Κομισιόν και όλα τα όργανα τη είναι υποχρεωμένε να ακολουθούν τι αρχέ των συνθήκων ακόμη και όταν λειτουργούν εκτό αυτού του πλαισίου. Νομίζω ότι είναι πολύ σημαντικό ζήτημα. Να περάσουμε γρήγορα στον κύριο Γιώργο Ανδρέου, επίκουρο καθηγητή τη στο Τμήμα Πολιτικών Επιστημών στο Αριστοτέλειο Πανεπιστήμιο Θεσσαλονίκη. Και για εσά ισχύει το.
thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Liebert for her very interesting and uh, thought-provoking uh, speech. Um, my contribution to this debate is going to be the discussion of solidarity, or rather of the lack of solidarity in the EU. So I'm going to be very pragmatic, pessimistic perhaps. I will start by quoting again Article 3 of the Treaty of the European Union, which among other things states that uh, the Union shall promote economic, social, and territorial cohesion and solidarity among member states. So uh, officially, one of the principles, one of the objectives of the EU is the promotion of uh, uh, cohesion and uh, solidarity between member states. Uh, in actual fact, I think that uh, reality does not correspond to, 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 to the wording of, of, of the treaty. And um, the reason is uh, very simply that uh, uh, European integration itself was not based on solidarity, it was based on uh, pragmatic interests. We should not forget that uh, uh, the foundation of uh, uh, the Union is uh, uh, the European Economic Community and the other two communities, which were essentially promoting uh, market integration uh, based on consensus. So uh, we're talking about a union of member states uh, which had as a main mission to promote market integration, that is to, to remove obstacles to the free working of, of the market. Um, so solidarity in the beginning was out of the question, was out of, out of context even, despite the fact of course that well, Many can argue that uh, European integration from the beginning served very important political objectives uh, as well. Um, so in this context, the, the inclusion of cohesion and solidarity as goals of, of, the, of the community came later in the 80s, in 1986, with the Single European Act, after the accession of uh, Greece, Spain, and, and Portugal to, to the EU. Um, the concept of cohesion is sort of explained, not quite in my view, further in the treaty, in Article 174. Um, this article states that in particular the Union shall aim at reducing disparities between the levels of development of the various uh, regions. So the, the aim of, uh, the objective of, co of cohesion mostly refers to uh, economic convergence between uh, regions. Um, so the concept of cohesion as uh, stated in, in, in the treaty is very vague. It is open to different, different contrasting interpretations. And uh, this concept is very marginal linked to the concept of traditional solidarity one meets in, in uh, national political uh, systems. We're talking about, uh, first of all, uh, kind of a territorial solidarity, a solidarity between regions, not between uh, social groups. Uh, a solidarity that uh, focuses mostly on increasing economic performance and competitiveness. So uh, its redistributive element is very, very weak. So the, the objective of, of cohesion policy as has been developed since the 80s is not to, to redistribute money from rich to poor. It is to, to finance or rather to co-finance selected investment that is going to increase economic performance. So redistribution in theory at least is not a goal, it's a, it's a means to, to an end. At the same time, I do recognize, and everybody recognizes, that uh, the EU budget has had very important uh, distributive implications. It has uh, helped the economic performance uh, of uh, uh, poorer member states, both in the past and now. Uh, in the 80s and the 90s, it was the southern member states that benefited. Nowadays, it's mostly the eastern member states that benefit from that. Uh, but still, um, this is a very limited uh, form of solidarity, which of course takes place in a very small uh, EU budget that, as Professor Liebert already stated, is just 1% of the EU's uh, GDP. And um, I, th I think it's obvious that uh, this limited form of, 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 of solidarity has been the, the rules ever since, uh, the, since the, the 80s, I mean. Uh, even the promotion of integration through the Maastricht Treaty and the subsequent uh, amendments of the treaties, even the Treaty of Lisbon has not progressed any further in this direction of more solidarity, I mean. Um, actually, um, deciding upon the EU budget is uh, left on uh, negotiations that take place mostly between member states uh, for uh, seven year programming periods. And uh, one would expect that 
taking into account the, the economic crisis that has happened since uh, 2008, 2009, the latest revisions of cohesion policy would lead to an increase of money or more solidarity for regions and states that are hit by the crisis. Quite the contrary. Uh, in the current programming period, uh, the budget for cohesion policy is 13% smaller than it used to be in the previous programming period. Uh, secondly, uh, financial aid to less developed regions uh, covers a smaller share of cohesion policy budget, and more developed regions get a larger share, larger share of cohesion money than they used to get before the crisis. How can this be explained? It, this has been officially explained through the linkage of cohesion policy to the new economic governance that uh, Professor Lube has very extensively covered in, it, it's in her publications. So the official explanation is that cohesion policy must be refocused from solidarity between uh, member states and regions towards uh, increasing uh, investment that is going to boost Europe's general overall competitiveness. So uh, the dominant uh, discourse on cohesion policy uh, begins to resemble more and more the narrative that uh, dominates uh, discussion of the Eurozone and uh, the orthodox economic thinking that has prevailed throughout Europe. Um, this is not uh, a surprise in my view because uh, ever since the Maastricht Treaty, this particular emphasis on uh, uh, sound money, competitiveness and structural reforms is the orthodox way of thinking and it continues to do so. Uh, some might say despite of the crisis, others might say because of the crisis, because different interpretations of the crisis as well. So uh, to try to reach a conclusion, I think that nowadays, in the, uh, at present time, um, one of the major impediments, perhaps the most important obstacle that the, the, the future of Europe is facing is how to overcome this solidarity deficit that is simply the reluctance of richer member states to pay for the poorer ones for any justification uh, whatsoever. Um, it is not worthy, I think, that uh, the Commission has deliberately uh, avoided into discussing this uh, issue of solidarity when presenting its uh, scenarios. Of course, uh, there has been a reflection paper about the EU finances as well, but again, the Commission has been very timid about proposing uh, or suggesting a possible increase in the EU budget in fact, it is one of the several scenarios that it has been uh, circulating. And this, I must say, this is 